I'll send him a message. La 18 no es la derecha. Y a la salida es la derecha y cuando tú sales después de la izquierda. Disturbers. A la, yeah. We're live? We are live. Okay, great. Welcome everyone. We will give a couple of moments just for the last few that are um, getting admitted to the waiting room uh, to join us. But thank you for your patience as we work through um, just a couple technical things to get us set up and ready. I think we're ready, yes. We are ready, okay. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we have an exciting topic. As you know, Education USA works throughout the globe to help students identify schools, universities, colleges that are their best fit. There are so many options of institutions to choose from, but it is more than just which institution. There is a diversity within the US that's important to also consider location, population, climate, many different choices. And so we are excited today to have a variety of institutional representatives join us and um, talk to us a little bit about where their institutions are located, the factors for you to think about as you are making those choices. Um, so I will hand it over to Christy to kick us off. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we're really happy to be with you today and to share a little bit of information about the, U, uh, about the US. Um, you know, we represent five different institutions and so you will be learning about our institutions, but you'll also be learning about the diversity of regions that we have in the US. Many of you may think of the United States and have a certain impression. You may have seen movies or met certain people and you think that you know um, a little bit about the US, but in reality, um, the United States is quite a diverse country and it's a large country too. So we have um, a vast um, country, we have a large population and this means that we actually have a lot of different um, values, different perspectives, different interests. So today we're going to try to give you a better idea of what that might look like um, and what each of those regions have to offer. Some of the things you might be doing is looking at and listening to what we have to say and having an idea of what region might be a good match for you as far as a place you want to live, an environment that you want to be in. Um, I'm going to check with my colleagues because we also um, have a PowerPoint and so, um, our, Christy, um, yeah. Patrick's Wi-Fi went out. So Corey okay. is downloading the PowerPoint and Corey is going to be just our hero and he will let us yeah, know. Give me is. a quick uh, two minutes or yeah. so to, to, I've got to get in and download it. But um, yes, we'll have the PowerPoint in just a moment. Apologies That's for the uh, technical difficulty. No problem. I can forge ahead. Um, so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure, no problem. So. Um, when we look at the U.S., we um, break down the U.S. often in different regions. So you might hear us talk about the Midwest or the South or the Northwest or the Northeast. These are not official regions. They don't have governors or mayors. They don't really have an official grouping, but it's just kind of more a cultural or geographical units that we look at the U.S. So this is something to think about as um, you um, are looking at different parts of the US is that we kind of group them together. And these groupings often have commonality. So you may find that within a region, the people in that region have similar habits. They have similar ways of thinking. They have similar likes, perspectives, lifestyles. Um, some of this may have to do with the climate. Some of this may have to do with um, the types of cities and um, the geography in that area. So there's a lot that impacts the different personalities of each of these regions. Um, but you will find that it's very diverse, even something like language. You would think we're one country, we speak English when you think of the US. However, even that 
um, speaking English, you'll find that there's different accents and dialects within the US. Um, I always tell the story, my parents actually grew up in New York City. And um, so right when I was young, uh, they moved to Iowa. So they moved to the Midwest. And my mom has a New York accent. So people in the Midwest are very confused because my mom pronounces words different ways than people in Iowa do. So sometimes they look at her oddly and can't quite understand what she's saying, even though they're speaking the same language. So you're gonna find that within the US, there are these different um, accents and dialects. And um, that's one thing that's very diverse about the US too. I think also one thing that we provide pride ourselves in in the US is the diversity of the people here. Um, our population is made up of people who have um, come from all around the world. They represent different countries, regions, religions, um, and backgrounds. So it's very hard to generalize the US and Americans because we really are representatives of the world and representatives of people from all over the world. So you're gonna find that um, it is um, you know, hard to, even in our conversations today, um, be able to come up with um, generalizations about the US and the different regions. So how are we doing on the PowerPoint? Uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay, wonderful. So um, one thing that we're gonna see in the PowerPoint is that we're trying to get across is this idea of the different um, ways the uh, different regions in the US approach things. Um, one of the slides that we're gonna introduce um, to you um, looks at the different impressions that people have of each other in the US. So I think you guys may find this in your own countries that you know people from the North have impressions about people from the South, people from the West kind of think something about the people from the East. Um, and this is true in the US and not all of these are accurate impressions or true impressions, but they are ones that people think and they're very interesting. And now that we have the PowerPoint, um, instead of me trying to explain those, I'll be able to show those. Um, so I think Corey's gonna, when he gets a chance, flip us to, um, I think we've talked about that. Um, let's, yes, this is, oh, go one back for me. Okay, this is kind of what I was talking about. So we think this is a fun um, slide because it kind of looks at the different perceptions that different people from different regions have of um, the um, people that live in certain areas of the US. And again, this isn't truth. This isn't um, the, you know, the, the way um, it is, it's just how people perceive things. So, you know, if you look at people in the West, the perception of people in the West of the US is that they're enthusiastic, that they're worldly, that they're uninhibited, that they're imaginative. Um, and so somehow people have this perception that that's people from the, excuse me, West, while when they look at people in the South, maybe they look at people that are more polite and easygoing, suspicious. I'm not sure where that comes from, but that's something interesting. And then we always give, like to give Corey a hard time, although you see that he is very nice. He's our hero today. Um, but the perception of people in the East is more aggressive and um, maybe also impatient and rude. So, you know, this idea that even within the US, we have different ideas of who we are in different regions. Next slide. So some other things to show the differences in the US that we wanted to share. Um, this one asks which state is more of a dog state or a cat state. The US is very much a country of people who love their pets. So um, you'll see up north in the northern states, there's very much a preference for cats. So that's good. I'm a cat person. So um, you'll find that um, people in the north like their cats where more in the south it's more of a dog country. So you're gonna find that that's um, something that is a difference. I mentioned this before and that's the diversity in the US. And I think this is really important because we, um, when we talk of the US, we can't talk 
uh, we, we can't leave out the idea that um, there's a lot of diversity. The first slide shows the largest religious traditions, the second largest tr religious, tr tr sorry, traditions in each state. So um, you're gonna find that the states that are in yellow, um, beyond, besides Christianity, the second largest religion practice is Buddhism. The states in green, it's Islam, and pink is Judaism. So again, this idea is very prevalent that you might think of the U.S. as a Christian country, but there are other religions and other practices that are very um, pract uh, practiced. In fact, I from Iowa and the Mother Mosque of the um, North America was built in Iowa. So there's things that surprise you in the US. Um, otherwise, um, you know, one thing that we kid about is, and I mentioned that we often refer to things or have different way language differences between the regions. And this is the big question. What is your um, generic term for a sweetened carbonated beverage? And you'll see here that throughout the US, we even call that one thing different. So in my region, we refer to it as pop in out where Corey is. It's more thought of as soda down where Sarah and Lynn are. They might refer to it as Coke, even if it's a Pepsi, they call it a Coke. So you're going to see this kind of difference. So I think in the end, what we're really trying to say is the U.S. isn't one country. You cannot describe it in one way. You can't think of it in one way because it's very diverse. And what we're going to do now is introduce each region and give you an idea of the personality and the aspects of each region. And you're gonna to have to listen to me keep talking because I am gonna be your start with your first region and that is the Midwest. So Midwest, central part of the US, these are the states that are represented in um, the central part of the US, next slide. Um, so you'll see that there are um, uh, several states that make up this region um, and um, they often, consider this region the heart of the U.S. Next slide. So you'll consider this um, America's heartland. I think people call it that because obviously it's the central part of the U.S., but it's also the part where a lot has grown. There's been a lot of innovation and a lot of good things that have come out of the Midwest. So it's kind of in a very, just like the heart is a very central part of your body and um, helps, you know, kind of feed everything, um, the Midwest is thought of the heart of the U.S. Now, when we think of the Midwest, we also think of a lot of different types of areas. So we have small towns. We have a lot of small towns or college towns. These are smaller cities. We also have big cities. We have one of the biggest cities in the U.S. is in the Midwest, and we have a lot of farming communities. So if you're looking for an area that offers all of these types of things, we have those. Um, you're gonna see that um, the largest city in the Midwest is Chicago. This is also the third largest city in the United States. Um, it's an amazing city, has a lot of culture, has a lot of shopping, has a lot of um, you know, history, lots of things to offer. Um, and so it's a great city, but there's other cities in the Midwest such as Detroit, St. Paul, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, and St. Louis. These are all really great cities that are in this region. Um, so another name that we call the Midwest um, is the breadbasket of the country. And this is really due to the fertile soil and the millions of acres of farmland in the Midwest. So even if you're in a big city in the Midwest, you don't have to drive far to then all of a sudden be surrounded by farmland. It's a pretty amazing area. Um, so you're going to find that there's a lot of things being grown in the Midwest, especially corn and soybeans. So um, if you're um, having one of those products, it's might, may, it may likely have been, come from the Midwest. Um, besides the vast landscape and farmland, we also have some of the major waterways in the United States. So you're gonna find um, the Mississippi River, the Missouri River, the um, Great Lakes are all located in the Midwest. These are great for entertainment. They're great for if you like nature to go and visit, but they're also mean that they, we have a lot of um, ports and transportation and manufacturing and things that are moving from one place to the other because of these waterways. So that's the reason that the Midwest is home to many 
Fortune 500 companies. So listed there, you'll see some of the Fortune 500 companies that are, that are um, founded in the Midwest. And you're gonna see that there are a lot of the global leaders in advanced manufacturing and research. So if this is an area that you might be interested in studying, um, you might find that the Midwest is a good spot for you to be able to study. Um, Chicago has some of the, you know, I think many of the, I think 36 of America's Fortune 500 companies. So it's the fourth, fourth most of any state. So there's a lot of innovation going on in the Midwest, lots of research and a lot of ways that if you're a student here, that you'd be able to get your hands on some of those types of experiences. And then just to wrap up, I think some of the fun aspects of the Midwest to think about. Um, people in the Midwest are often described as being open, friendly, and straightforward. Um, I'm from Iowa and there's something called Iowa nice. Sometimes students come here and they're confused because everyone's saying hi to them and asking how they're doing, but that's just kind of the way of life here. People are friendly, people help you out. Um, it's known to be very safe in many of the regions of the Midwest. So I think a lot of people come to live here and are very comfortable. My, as I mentioned, my parents moved here from New York City and they loved growing up in New York, but now their home is Iowa and they wouldn't go anywhere else. So um, the accent here in the Midwest is um, known to be a pure English. So you're gonna find that the way people speak English in the Midwest is the standard English. So if you're coming to learn English in the US, some people like to come to the Midwest because the way we pronounce words is kind of the standard um, English language and it's nice to be able to hear that and emulate that. Um, some other fun things just to know is that if you come to the Midwest, there's some great places to visit. The Gateway Arch is in St. Louis. Sears Tower, largest building in the US is in Chicago. And then if you like to shop, you cannot miss the Mall of America. So that's one of the highlights. Um, so let me talk about a little bit about my university. Um, and that's the University of Northern Iowa. You can see here a beautiful university located in um, Iowa. Um, we are a public university and we offer masters and bachelor's programs for students. So maybe something that you might be interested in. Next slide. Um, you know, as I mentioned, um, we are a public school and um, we're a medium sized university. So as you look at the United States, you're going to find schools that are small, some that are very big, um, but we're kind of medium sized and we pride ourselves on the fact that we offer a environment where students can get involved, can get a lot of help and assistance and support because we're not such a big school. We are really focused on helping students. Um, we do have a diversity of programs, as I mentioned, 90 different bachelor's programs and 50 different master, masters and PhDs. And those are in the areas of our College of Business, our College of Humanities, Arts and Sciences, College of Education and Social and Behavioral Science. So um, later on, you'll have my contact information. I'll be happy to um, tell you more about some of those programs. Next slide. So some of the features that we like to share about the University of Northern Iowa, um, beyond the diverse programs we offer, I'll also mention the small class sizes. Um, 27 is our average class size, but as you get into your major or if you're a grad student, you're looking at more, maybe 10 to 15 students. So, you know, why not go to a school where you're going to get a lot of attention, personal attention, you're going to be able to really get involved in your classes and in research and in activities. Um, so we think that's a real advantage. Also, um, I'll mention that we have students from over 60 different countries. So you'll meet students from every part of the globe and you'll be able to get engaged um, with those students. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, you saw the a picture of our beautiful campus. We have a park-like campus. So if you're looking for like the quintessential um, U.S. university that you see in movies where there's, you know, grass and old buildings and little squirrels and bunnies jumping around. That's kind of our um, campus. We have a bell tower in the middle of campus that rings on the hour. Um, and then as you're on campus, we have 65 different buildings. So you'll have your academic buildings, your residence halls, 
and your buildings to, we have um, buildings to uh, do sports in, we have a huge library, we have um, areas to be social. So it's like a little city and you'll be very comfortable there. As you noted here, we were ranked one of the safest campuses in the US. So that's something that I think is very valuable. You'll feel very comfortable there and at ease. Um, and there'll be a lot of people there to help you. Um, and then just looking at student life, one of the benefits of going to school in the US is what we do outside of the classroom. So that is the opportunity to get engaged. So at UNI, um, you'd be able to do research, you'd be able to work on the campus, you can join clubs and organizations. All of these things are gonna help build a resume when you're looking for a job or looking for further education. Um, we have 93% of our students graduate completing some sort of field work. So your resume is going to have this kind of, um, you know, breadth because your breadth because you are um, able to access these types of activities and internships and employers are going to want to see that. And in the end, 94% of our graduates are um, able to find jobs or high, um, opportunities in um, higher ed when they graduate. So we have a really high success rate. So um, next slide. So that kind of wraps up a little information about the Midwest and um, about University of Northern Iowa. Thanks for your patience on our start there. But I'm going to pass it over to Patrick and he's going to talk about the um, wonderful aspects of the Northern Great Plains. Uh, thank you, Christy, and apologies to everyone. Um, right about 9.01, my, the entire internet in my neighborhood went out, um, so I'm on a hot spot. So if I do cut out again, feel free, fellow panelists, just to uh, to move on to the next region if anything goes awry. So as Christy said, I'm Patrick Morrison. Um, I'm with the uh, University of South Dakota, and today I'm going to talk about the Northern Great Plains. So these are the states in red, mainly Montana, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming. So, um, so the whole this part of the country is really known um, to a lot of Americans for our na for the national parks in the region. So, the first official national park, um, Yellowstone National Park, is in this region. We have six of the sixty-two kind of major national parks, plus another um, ten or sorry nine national monuments, including the first national monument, Devil's Tower in Wyoming. So, uh, yeah, most Americans that come to this region for tourism come expressly to visit the national parks. So about 13 million visitors a year um, come to the region and about um, 4 million go to um, Wind Cave, or sorry, to um, Yellowstone. Um, that's a, okay, Corey, you can go to the next slide. So um, wide open spaces, as you can see here, um, it's a pretty sparsely populated region, um, but quite large. So it's about, um, for Philippines for context, if you're familiar, it's about four times the size of the Philippines, but it's about half the size of Saudi Arabia. So obviously Saudi Arabia is one of the world's largest countries, but yet we're about half the size of Saudi. Um, so we have about 5 million people spread over 1.2 million square kilometers. Uh, so of the top um, eight least densely populated states, um, we are all five states in the region fall in that number. So that being said, um, there are still cities and population centers. In fact, most people in the great Northern Great Plains do live in, you know, cities and towns. So Omaha, Nebraska is about a million people. Lincoln, Nebraska is about 330,000 people. Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Fargo, North Dakota are both about 250,000. Um, so if you do come to study in the Great Plains, you know, you're most likely going to be in one of these cities or other, you know, cities of 10 to 30,000 people. You're not going to be out in the middle of nowhere with a three-hour drive to the next town. Next slide. Um, so this is a, the main economic input in a lot of the region is natural resources. So we are um, leaders. So North Dakota leads the nation in wheat production. They go back and forth with Kansas every year. Wyoming is by far the largest producer of coal um, in the United States. North Dakota is number two in crude oil production. Um, uh, strong mining history in Western South Dakota, Montana and Wyoming. Um, so silver and lead mines in Montana, gold in Western South Dakota. Um, so there are schools like Montana Tech, South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, University of Wyoming that really do excel in mining and metallurgical engineering and related programs because of that. And then the schools um, focusing on agriculture production, um, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, 
and South Dakota State, North Dakota State are quite good in those areas. So if you are interested in anything, animal science, plant science, um, you know, egg business, those sorts of things, you can get pretty solid programs in the region. Um, but also green energy um, is an increasing um, emphasis. Um, we're seeing increasing importance in this region. So um, one of the largest producers of, um, where the region's one of the largest producers of hydroelectric power, um, about 20 billion kilowatt hours of hydroelectric power produced in these five states. Wind energy is rapidly growing. Um, and of the top 10 states for green energy production that produce the most green energy, um, three of the states um, in this region are in that top 10. So it is very much a emphasis placed on that. But it's all about not all about natural resources. So you can see here that there is some variance in the economies of this of the region. So Nebraska, their largest industry by far is actually insurance. So about eight billion dollars a year, um, which again, considering the population of Nebraska is a pretty high amount. So Berkshire Hathaway, Mutual of Omaha, um, both Fortune 500 companies. Berkshire Hathaway, of course, is Warren Buffett's company, is headquartered in Omaha. They do a lot of business and insurance. Wyoming, naturally. Uh, mining due to coal production. South Dakota, my state, our largest industry is actually banking by about, with about $4 billion, which again, as a percentage of our population um, is notable. Wells Fargo, Citibank, um, First Premier Bank all have um, corporate headquarters in our state. North Dakota, again, you know, since they're a large crude oil producer, it makes sense that they have oil and gas production as their largest industry. But then you have Montana, which whose largest industry is healthcare. Um, and in fact, um, that is healthcare is one of the most rapidly growing industries, well, in the U.S. in general, but especially in our region, um, just in South Dakota, North Dakota, about um, our two major health systems employ about 30,000 people each, which again, based on our population, is a pretty, um, pretty high percentage. So I think with that, we'll go on to, I'll just speak briefly about the university. So, um, so about my university, University of South Dakota, um, we are a liberal arts um, flagship university. We have about 200 undergraduate programs, 70 graduate programs. Our popular majors are biomedical engineering, business analytics, chemistry, computer sciences, health sciences, physics. Um, these are for international students. Um, so, but we also have programs in the fine arts and humanities that tend to see, get more interest from um, US students. Similar to Northern Iowa, we do have small class sizes, about one in every two class, um, classes have less than 20 students in them. Um, for us, a big class would be like 50 students. And I think about six to 7% of our classes have over 50 students. Um, and we have a student faculty ratio. It's now 15 to one, it just, the new numbers came out just this week. Um, and uh, we are unique in that we have the highest percentage of college students of any town in America. Um, we are in a very small college town of about 10 to 12,000. Plus we have um, about in town 7,500 students. So we have about 70% of the town are college students. So it is a unique environment produced by that. Next slide. So some unique programs, you know, we of course have things like biomedical engineering, but I kind of wanted to talk about Everywhere to the north of it is been dammed for hydroelectric power. To the south of it is channelized for like shipping traffic, barge traffic. Um, and so we really um, have a lot of emphasis on um, ecology, wetland ecology, um, fish and wildlife species, conservation, things like that. Um, and so we have a, um, a specific institute set up to study this area and to help protect it. The Sanford Underground Research Facility is in the western part of our state. Um, we're a lead partner. They really focus on neutrino and dark matter detection. So if you've heard of Fermilab in Illinois, um, they do a lot of work um, with Fermilab. Basically, lab about a kilometer underground, and we're sending and receiving neutrinos um, as they pass through the Earth with the goal of detecting dark matter. So our physics program is really involved in that. Uh, the National Music Museum um, in the bottom left of your screen there, it's currently undergoing um, a massive expansion and renovation. It is one of the largest collections of musical instruments in the world, um, one of the oldest playable harpsichords, um, the oldest cello in existence that belonged to King Henry IV of France is in our collection. Um, a lot of just unique instruments from all over the world. And so um, a lot of uh, music programs that um, are attached to that, including a master's of
um, Institute of American Indian Studies. Um, we are, um, the university is located on the lands of the Great Sioux Nation, and so we have a um, major emphasis on studying um, native um, peoples and languages. We have an oral history center, um, and we just received um, a significant investment from the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, um, just announced um, on Monday, because it was Indigenous Peoples Day here in South Dakota. Um, and uh, so that's really interested in indigenous rights, rights of indigenous peoples. It's a, uh, perhaps an interesting program for you. And then last slide, um, just want to touch on our affordability. That is what we're known for in the region. Um, we are the most affordable flagship university in the United States. Both graduate and undergraduate tuitions, about $12,800 per year, have a very low cost of living, as Christy um, talked about in her um, opening slides. We do have merit scholarships available for undergraduate students and then um, assistantships for both, both MS and PhD. So if you do have any questions about USD, our contact information will be at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to Corey to talk about the Northeast. Thank you, Patrick. And um, yeah, hopefully I can do this all uh, walk in change the slides at the same time while talking. Uh, again, my name is Corey Cottingham. I represent the New York University Tandon School of Engineering. Uh, we are located in Brooklyn, New York, which is uh, part of the Northeast region of the United States. Uh, so here on the uh, slide, you will see some of the, or rather the states that comprise the Northeastern uh, part of the country. We are relatively small geographically, but uh, historically have a lot of significance in uh, terms of the development of the United States, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Um, so the Northeast is the most densely populated region of the United States. We have around 55 million people uh, with um, only about 5% of the land area. So about 85% of our people are living either in cities or towns uh, throughout the region. One, I think, uh, misconception, though, is that the Northeast is just this uh, megalopolis, the giant city uh, that runs from Boston down to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, but we are actually uh, covered 60% in forest as well and do have everything from mountains to a beautiful coastline along the Atlantic Ocean uh, with plenty of small and mid-sized towns in between. So uh, if you're looking at the Northeast, we do have great large cities, but we're not just that for those who are looking for a bit more, um, a smaller place to do their studies. Uh, the Northeast as a historic center of uh, arrival to the United States for both Europeans, people from uh, Asia, Latin America, uh, the Middle East, and everywhere in between, uh, does have one of the highest levels of diversity of all of the region. About 16% of the residents of the Northeast were born outside of the United States, and that's about 21% of the total foreign-born population of the U.S. And in fact, here in New York, one in four of our residents were born outside of the United States, and we are the most linguistically diverse uh, city and region in uh, the world with around 800 languages being spoken in New York City alone. And about half of New York City families speak a language other than English of home. So at home rather. So wherever you are coming from, you will uh, be able to learn from people of diverse backgrounds uh, and also to connect with a community of similar backgrounds when you want to uh, perhaps speak your own language, food, and uh, otherwise interact in that way. Uh, the region is one of the most religiously diverse as well with only around 65% of our residents identifying as uh, some form of Christian. About 25% are non-religious and around 10% would uh, be of other faiths. So wherever you are coming from, the Northeast will welcome you with open arms. We are uh, known for the strength of the economy in the Northeast as the historic center of manufacturing, which has transitioned, um, not wholly, but in the most part to a service-based economy. Uh, and you will see some of the major Fortune 500 companies listed on this slide. Uh, we do represent 23% of the total gross domestic product of the United States. And as I mentioned, uh, that's on about 5% of the land area. 162 of the Fortune 500 companies, the largest companies in the United States are based here in the Northeast and our economy is comparable in size to that of Japan. So we have uh, a lot of industry, a varied uh, 
types of industry and that provides plenty of internship and job opportunities for students who come and study with us here in the Northeast. Uh, there is, I think, especially uh, outside of the United States, sometimes a, a, a perhaps unnecessary focus on the Ivy League, which are uh, some of the oldest and most prestigious universities in the United States. All of those are uh, located here in the Northeast due to, again, our history as an area of uh, colonization uh, in the country. But we are much more than just the Ivy League. We have a total of around 1,500 colleges and universities, everything from large private uh, universities like uh, NYU, which is located in a major urban center, to smaller liberal arts colleges out in uh, a small town in the mountains. So um, that and everything in between uh, can be found here in the Northeast, depending on what you are looking for. We do receive a great number of, uh, or rather a high percentage of the international students who come to study in the United States with around 31% total studying at a university in the Northeast. And my home university of New York University actually hosts more international students than any other university in the US with around 19,000 students total. So we're here in the Northeast, very accustomed to welcoming and helping our international student body succeed. And one of the ways that we do that are providing good internship and job opportunities following graduation. The New York City metro area uh, actually retains more of its graduates to uh, participate in an optional practical training or OPT, which are internships following graduation uh, than any other metro region in the US with around 75% of the international students who come to study with us in uh, New York City staying here and getting some job experience after graduation. Uh, I think, of course, people know that New York City is uh, influential in the area of finance and financial services, also media and entertainment, but uh, sometimes people don't realize uh, that we're also the second largest technology um, center in the United States. So uh, really anything in the STEM fields, you should find plenty of opportunities here. Construction as well. So if you're interested in civil engineering, structural and those types of things, uh, if you can learn to build a building in Manhattan, which is uh, one of the densest and busiest cities in the world, you can do it just about anywhere. Uh, biotechnology, there are centers both in New York City and Boston, among other areas, as I mentioned, education with uh, the history that we have and the density of uh, colleges and universities, plenty of opportunities for you there. All in all, though, the international students who come and study with us in the Northeast do very well for themselves, both during and after their programs. I mentioned that I represent the New York University Tandon School of Engineering. So you may be interested in some other New York University programs. And unfortunately, I'm probably not the best person to tell you about that, although uh, I can put you in contact with my colleagues. At the Tandon School of Engineering, we do offer 31 uh, degree programs at the master's and PhD level. And you'll see those listed here on the screen. One of the things that we uh, like to uh, and actually there's a typo on this slide, I think. Um, but we are um, very proud to offer flexible classes in that our students are able to do some coursework online, uh, to do it in the evenings and even on Saturdays in some cases so that you can participate in an internship concurrently with your program of study. You don't have to do it during a break uh, in your classes, but rather uh, do so at the same time that you are uh, studying during the semester. To give you an idea of the Tandon School of Engineering in specific, uh, New York University has over 20 different schools. We're just one of those 20 schools. Uh, NYU has around 60,000 students total. Uh, so it's a very large, the largest private nonprofit university in the US. But the Tandon School of Engineering has around 5,500 students, uh, which is evenly broken down between undergraduate and graduate students. So we do uh, put a focus on supporting our master's and PhD students. And that shows in the amount of research funding and other uh, resources that we devote to uh, supporting those students. The GRE this year has now been waived for all but one of our programs, but if you do take the GRE, to give you an idea of what we would consider a competitive score uh, would be an average on the verbal section of 151 and the average on the quantitative um, just moved up to 164. Uh, so to give you an idea of students who submit scores, uh, that would be um, 
what we would consider a decent score for you to have. We look at a minimum GPA of 3.0 out of four, and we'll convert your international transcripts into a US style GPA after we receive them and do an evaluation. I mentioned that New York City is uh, obviously one of the more diverse places in the US. We have students from over 60 countries in the Tandon School of Engineering and well over 100 at uh, NYU as a whole. Uh, for selectivity, about one in three this year, it was 35% of the students who completed our graduate uh, applications for study were admitted. I'm not going to have time to get into everything, but the uh, Tandon School of Engineering is the second oldest private school of engineering, science and technology in the United States. So since uh, 1854, over 160 years, we have been innovating at the forefront of uh, engineering, science and technology. I'm not going to go through all of these, but some highlights are uh, one of our professors took some of the first successful x-rays. One of our alumni was the designer of the Apollo lunar lander. Uh, the development of the modern barcode scanner, the ATM, uh, and 5G wireless technology more recently have all taken place here at NYU Tandon. If you're interested in cybersecurity, we host the world's largest student-led uh, hackathon every year, which is Seesaw, uh, and we are able to connect our students with opportunities uh, to hack many different large companies, of course, with their cooperation, including the Pentagon. Some other research that's happening here at Tandon, I'm not going to have time to get into all of it in great depth, but pictured here we have Professor Maurizio Porfiri, who works in our uh, mechatronics and robotics department, among others. He has his hand in uh, several different things, but uh, he's developed robotic fish, which are able to mimic the behavior of uh, real fish in the wild and can be used to lead uh, marine life away from sources of pollution and uh, more recently have been used to uh, deter invasive species from reproducing in some of the coral reefs off the coast of Australia. So do take a look at our website and look at the various types of research that are happening within your field of interest. Uh, I'm sure you'll see plenty of opportunities for you there. We uh, focus on innovation as a, a school, and one of the ways that we promote innovation are through our future labs. And we have four of these future labs, which functionally are incubators. Uh, we have our data future lab, digital future lab, urban future lab, uh, which is looking at the smart cities of the future, and also our veterans future lab. So uh, in these future labs, students are able to submit a proposal for a project. They will receive seed funding, administrative support, office space, as well as mentorship from local business leaders and faculty members. To date, these future labs have generated over four billion dollars uh, for the New York City economy just since 2009 and created over 3,200 jobs. Um, I need to update this slide but we've had over a uh, 100 startups um, that have matured out of the Future Lab incubator uh, to be full-fledged companies in their own right. So if you do have an entrepreneurial bent, uh, our Future Labs are a fantastic opportunity for you to come here to New York City and get your idea into the world. We do know that it is a big decision to choose to study a master's or PhD program. That's a significant investment of your time, uh, perhaps funds and effort, uh, but it is one at the NYU Tandon School of Engineering that we're certain will be a strong return or represents a strong return on investment. One of the ways that we know that are through uh, our most recent class uh, we did a study and they responded that 97% were working within their field of study within three months of graduation. Uh, we have a mid-career salary range for our graduates of just under $120,000 per year. And I think perhaps most interestingly is that uh, out of the hundreds of US engineering schools, pay scale ranked us as number four among all of them for salary potential. I'm going to put my contact information in the chat box and we'll also be uh, adding a sign up for you to receive more information if you would like. Um, but I do hope you are interested in getting more information and learning more about the northeastern area of the United States. With that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Sarah, who will be speaking on the southeastern region of the US. Thank you. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Noppen, and I am the Director of International Admissions here at Florida International University, uh, located in Miami, Florida. So uh, as you've heard, uh, there's lots of variety of dialects and all of that. I have a Midwestern dialect, uh, so uh, that's why uh, you can probably understand me very well. Um, not being from the Southeast uh, myself, um, these are all of the 12 very diverse states that make up the Southeast. Um, I have had the opportunity uh, to travel to nearly all of them uh, since it is pretty typical for uh, parents in the southeast uh, or in the north northwest um, uh, in the midwest uh, to pile all their kids into the car and take road trips so i've had the opportunity uh, to visit most of the states as well as uh, now live in two of these 12 states so um <clears throat> This region is very, very diverse, uh, ranges from the beautiful beaches um, up to the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, we're known primarily for Southern hospitality. Uh, we're the birthplace of uh, country, bluegrass, and jazz music, and we boast some amazing cuisine. Uh, and that's due, of course, to the diversity of influences and the people that call the Southeast region home. Um, so in South, in um, Louisiana, you'll find a mix of Creole and French influences and down in Florida, you'll find a variety of um, Caribbean and Latin American influence as well. Um, so you'll find that it's uh, very, very diverse. You go up north and uh, you'll have um, a, a different mix of foods and people as well. Um, but we are known uh, for being um, for being the, the Sun Belt, uh, that uh, means our climate is, is more mild. It tends to be uh, hotter, longer, so uh, hot summers and short winters, uh, which of course lends its name to the Sun Belt. Uh, but we're also known as the Bible Belt, and this is typically because we have a bit more conservative, religious, and family-based values. Now, that doesn't mean that we here uh, are not curious about others. We absolutely are, and you'll find that the Southeast as being very hospitable, uh, is very open uh, to people from around the world. <laughs> now, early in our uh, history, the Southeast was primarily an agricultural hub. Now, the Midwest was known as the breadbasket. We, however, were producing uh, cash crops, such as uh, tobacco, cotton, and peanuts. Uh, but this gave rise to important shipping hubs. Now, while the port cities remain important uh, for shipping, tourism, and the cruise industries, uh, the Southeast has now known for its large service sectors. So things like manufacturing, uh, technology, and financial sectors. Uh, so if you'll go on to the next, uh, these are some of our Fortune 500 companies. And if you tap again, you'll see how that breaks out between the various states. Now, usually the Midwest and the Detroit region is known for uh, a various numbers of automobile companies, uh, but the Southeast has risen as uh, a larger, a large producer of uh, automobiles. So things like Mercedes and Hyundai are in Alabama. Uh, BMW is in South Carolina. Toyota is in Mississippi. Is in Mississippi. Kia in Georgia, Volkswagen in, uh, in both Virginia and Tennessee, and Nissan and uh, GM are also in Tennessee. So there's a large variety of uh, Fortune 500 companies and a wide variety of uh, manufacturing happening throughout the Southeast. I do like to focus on states uh, to give you kind of a flavor of what's going on. Uh, so the first one I'd like to highlight is Virginia. Uh, Virginia has the highest concentration of technology workers of any state and the fourth uh, highest number of technology workers after California, Texas, and New York. Uh, computer chips became the state's highest grossing export back in 2006 and Northern Virginia, which was once considered the state's dairy capital, now hosts uh, software, communication technology, uh, defense contracting companies, and this is primarily due to the uh, Dulles Technology Corridor and the Tyson's Corner uh, area. And this, of course, due to the proximity to Washington, D.C., and a lot of um, the defense uh, companies that, that make that area home. The state also has the highest average uh, and peak internet speeds uh, in the U.S. Uh, and the third highest worldwide. And Northern Virginia's uh, data center can now carry up to 70% of the nation's internet traffic. And back in uh, 2015, the region uh, was the largest and fastest growing data uh, center market in the nation. Now, I also like to highlight some of the very cool research that's happening uh, as a part of uh, research parks and a lot 
lot of this is a private public partnership between uh, the state. They provide um, uh, tax incentives for companies, uh, but they also want to harness the power of local uh, uh, universities that are there. So the Virginia Biotechnology Research Park, uh, located in Richmond, Virginia, is a 34-acre commercial life sciences hub. It's adjacent to the Virginia Commonwealth University a Medical Center, and it houses nearly 70 public and private life science companies, research institutes, and they're all affiliated with the VCU Medical Center. So it has now become a prominent state and national uh, medical laboratories. Now, uh, just south of Virginia is Georgia. Uh, Georgia is home to 17 of the uh, 500, uh, Fortune 500 companies and uh, 26 Fortune 1000 companies. It's headquartered, uh, it, headquarters of uh, Home Depot, UPS, Coca-Cola, uh, Delta Airlines, Aflac, you name it, it has quite a bit going on. Uh, it's also known for CNN. Uh, and Atlanta boasts the world's busiest airport uh, hub, and that's measured both in passenger traffic and in airport uh, aircraft traffic. They also are home to Port Savannah, which is the fourth largest seaport and the fastest growing uh, container seaport in North America. Now that's not all that's happening uh, in Georgia. Um, most people think of California when they think of uh, the film industry. However, Georgia has uh, boasts that more top grossing films uh, are filmed in Georgia than anywhere else in the world. And part of that is because uh, of the climate. So, um, you have um, beautiful landscapes, you have the, uh, the mountains towards the north, the beaches towards the southeast, uh, and then that way you can, you can really choose to film all year round, which is the reason why uh, Georgia has, uh, has a, a very large and growing uh, film industry. Now, finally, I'd like to focus on my home, my current home state of Florida. Uh, as of 2018, uh, the gross state product uh, was about $1 trillion, which is the fourth largest economy in the US. The world's top three busiest cruise ports are found in Florida, and the, that is Port Miami, uh, which is the busiest, Port Canaveral, and then Port Everglades. Uh, we are also now home to a, a sizable aerospace industry, uh, which uh, is located right outside of Daytona, um, which is Port Canaveral and the Kennedy Space Center. And uh, if you watch the SpaceX launch uh, earlier this year, that happened uh, just outside the coast of Florida. Tourism uh, makes up one of the largest uh, sectors of the state economy with nearly 1.4 million people employed in the tourism industry. Now we're not all about beautiful uh, places and beaches, uh, but we have also very cool uh, research going on. Uh, Florida boasts uh, the National High Magno Magnetic Laboratory, uh, which is in Tallahassee, which is the state capital. It's the largest laboratory in the world devoted to the study of magnetism. It performs magnetism and research in a wide variety of fields, and it's the only such facility in the U.S. Every year, uh, more than a thousand scientists from a dozen countries come to the MAG labs uh, to work with this unique um, laboratory. And thanks to funding from the National Science Foundation in the state of Florida, these researchers uh, are able to use the facilities for free. So currently the lab holds the world record for possessing the largest, uh, strongest magnet for nuclear magnetic resonance exper uh, experiments. So that's very, very cool and, um, and something that is quite unique uh, within the state of Florida. Now, finally, uh, you've heard me talk a little bit about these research triangles and, and what is happening uh, there. Um, so I'd like to highlight a few more to give you uh, a sense of, of some of the very cool research that's going on and often what you can find at other universities throughout the Southeast. So uh, the Research Triangle Park in the Raleigh-Durham urban area is located uh, in North Carolina and it has merged as a major hub of uh, technology, governmental and biotechnology research Research and development. The, uh, the park hosts one of Glaxo Smith Klein, and if you're not aware of this company, uh, they're a British multinational pharmaceutical company, and it has uh, their largest R&D center with about 5,000 employees. Uh, this research park is also home to Cisco Systems. Cisco Systems is a uh, large um, uh, multinational um, 
a technology conglomerate and they're located in California, but they have one of their largest uh, headquarters outside of California, also in this park with about 5,000 employees. So uh, this is their second highest concentration of employees outside of Silicon Valley. And the uh, National Park uh, Institutes of, and Health Institutes um, are really, uh, you know, very cool things happening there uh, across the board. Now, we also don't think very much um, about Alabama sometimes, which is unfortunate. Uh, the Cummings Research Park in Huntsville, Alabama is one of uh, the largest research parks in the world. Um, it's the second actually uh, largest research park of its kind. Um, and uh, they're doing a lot of uh, very cool research as well. I can't find my notes, one second. Um, uh, so they have a mixture of Fortune 500 companies, uh, one of the largest local international high-tech space and national defense agencies are in this park as well. So it becomes a thriving incubator of uh, competitive uh, industry, innovation, and, um, uh, and higher education institutions. And finally, um, I used to live in Columbia, South Carolina, um, and so I like to uh, highlight them a little bit. They have the nation's only uh, National uh, Science Foundation funded uh, industry that is a cooperative research group uh, dedicated to uh, fuel cells and fuel cell research. So with that, I will um, give you a little bit of overview of my institution, which is Florida International uh, University, or FIU for short. Uh, this is our beautiful beach, uh, South Beach. Uh, we are located about um, 15 to 20 minutes outside of the beach itself, closer to the airport. Uh, so you'll find that uh, we, it is very park-like, it is very safe, it's a little bit, again, outside the city, but you can still use the city as, um, you know, like your home base uh, as well, so you're not too far from uh, the beauty of the beach, if that's what interests you. Um, we do have a variety of rankings uh, that I like to highlight. Uh, FIU is the fourth largest public research institution in the U.S. Uh, we, we have more than 56,000 students uh, from all over the world. Uh, our primary uh, student numbers actually come from Latin and South America. Of course, that's due to our location in Miami. Um, and it, we've become the gateway of Latin and South America. So many companies uh, from Latin and South America headquarter in Miami in order to do business with the rest of the U.S. and the rest of North America, as well as quite a few U.S. companies headquarter down here to do business with Latin and South America. And on the next slide, uh, you'll see some more of our rankings that I like to highlight. Uh, we've been in the news more recently for uh, hurricane season. Uh, thankfully, we have not experienced them this year, but our research that's happening as part of our engineering school, uh, we have the Wall of Wind, which is a hurricane simulator. It's 12 gigantic fans. Um, which uh, make up Category 5 hurricane research. Uh, the, the idea is we want to make people safer and we want to make sure that we're building buildings uh, to withstand uh, natural disasters. We also have uh, the Aquarius uh, Marine Base, which is located just outside of um, of uh, uh, Miami itself. It's located in the Florida Keys and there we do a variety of research um, that's happening uh, both uh, with marine life uh, but also we work with NASA uh, to help train their astronauts uh, to understand what it's like to be up in space. Um, because again, we are uh, very close to the rest of Latin and South America, we have uh, one of the top ranked international business schools. Uh, we also are well known in the city of Miami uh, for Art Deco, which has given rise to one of uh, the best architecture programs in the US. Uh, I did also mention uh, marine biology as part of our marine reef base. So there's a wide, wide variety of uh, programs and things happening. So nearly 200 different academic programs that you can be a part of at both the, the bachelor's, master's, and PhD level. And finally, the next slide uh, will show a few more of our exciting research labs and other things that are happening. I'd be remiss not to talk about uh, the SOBI, which is South Beach Wine and Food Festival. Uh, that's part of our hospitality uh, school. 
Uh, they, uh, this, this huge event uh, each year is um, a production actually of the Food Network. It started as a um, FIU event, but our students continue to run the entire event. And a lot of the money that is raised um, through this effort uh, comes back to our students in the form of scholarships and a lot of uh, great practical experience that our students get in actually uh, facilitating a large, large event. So. Um, Hospitality, of course, is one of the major things that we're known for. And of course, at FIU, we excel in this area. Now, um, we like to also have fun down here in Miami. Uh, so pre-COVID, we were doing a lot of on-campus events. Uh, this is our summer fest. So each year, uh, we have uh, large um, uh, concerts for our students that are completely free. Uh, we have more than 300 different uh, student organizations. You name it, you can probably find uh, your niche. Uh, and if you don't, you can always start it. Uh, so a wide variety of things for you to do, both inside the classroom and outside, uh, because we want you to be a very well-rounded student when you leave FIU. So with that, I will turn it on over to my colleague, Lynn, to talk more about the Southwest. Thank you very much, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I'm going to talk to you about the Southwest portion of the United States, which comprises of four different states, the four here in the red. You can see it's a very large landmass. Um, Texas, uh, where I'm located, is the largest state in the contiguous United States. Um, that landmass is um, huge, um, larger than Japan, larger than the Philippines, um, larger than uh, two or three different countries in Southeast Asia. Um, the states are Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. Uh, way before the United States became a state, we we're all part of Mexico. Um, the region is known for a lot of different things. It's known for um, its national parks and monuments. It's known for its wide open spaces. It's known for the desert and red rock landscapes. Um, the Grand Canyon um, is one of the features. It is in Arizona. Um, I used to work at Northern Arizona University and we had a lot of geology students because they would uh, use the Grand Canyon as their classroom, which is really, you know, a great place to know about the entire history of the earth because um, it does go down to, oh, several thousand years. Um, we're also known for um, cactus and uh, beautiful mountains. Um, the mountains you see here um, are located in uh, Arizona, and it does snow there. Um, so we have everything from hot desert, sandy deserts, um, all the way up to uh, mountains where uh, snow is definitely possible. Um, there's a lot of outdoor activities in the area, um, and it's just a really nice place to be um, in a big city or out in the country. Next, please. So not only are we a large landmass, but we also um, are home to several Fortune 500 companies. Um, in Texas, we also have a lot of oil and gas um, industry, um, as well as wind industry here. Uh, tourism is very large in Arizona and New Mexico because of the uh, beautiful mountains, uh, really fabulous um, Native American um, homelands. Um, and um, artist communities throughout the uh, mountain regions of the states. Um, Oklahoma is also known for um, oil and gas, as well as um, tourism and some really beautiful um, nature areas. Um, as you can see, uh, the economy of the Southwest is very robust. Um, these are the leading uh, industries um, in the Southwest, which um, is really varied. And so if you are a student who are studying somewhere in the Southwest, the likelihood of you being able to find um, uh, training or job sharing um, during your uh, time as a student or after graduation using OPT, um, you might find yourself in any one of these different industries. And as you can see, you know, we're, we're not slacking in the money generated from the industries that we have. Um, we are really robust um, in the state of Texas pre-COVID. Uh, I heard on the news one day that every four minutes a new person moved into the state. So that shows the robust economy of the region, which is fabulous. Um, I'll talk to you about uh, one of my sister cities, Houston. 
Uh, it is located in the south part of Texas on the Gulf. Um, it is the largest city in Texas and probably the largest city in the region, although maybe Phoenix is, you know, up there as well. Um, it's the fourth most populous city and uh, it is the largest in the Southwest. Um, it's a very diverse area uh, with people from all over the world um, because of its vicinity to the Caribbean and also to Mexico. It's, it's a really beautiful um, part. Um, you can see sort of the urban city light and then also, you know, the kid on the skateboard in the skateboard park. You know, that's a big thing here in the United States are skateboard parks. Um, there's one near my house here. And this, this morning on my walk, I actually saw three kids in there already. Uh, I guess that they're doing virtual school because, you know, I would have thought they would have been going to school, but nope, they were in the skate park. Um, next, please. So Phoenix, uh, which is in the uh, middle part of the state of Arizona, is very deserty. Um, it can get, oh, up to, in uh, centigrade, probably up to 40, 43 in the summer for days and days on end. So that's in the upper 120s in Fahrenheit. Uh, the interesting thing about Phoenix is that despite it being in the desert, um, it is one of the only U.S. cities that has all four major sports franchises, including ice hockey. So imagine playing ice hockey in the middle of the desert. It's kind of an interesting concept. Um, Arizona itself uh, is home not only to the Grand Canyon, but to over 32 uh, native uh, people's uh, homelands, um, including the Navajo, Hopi, Havasupai, Apache, and others. Um, the state itself goes everywhere from the deserts where you're gonna see the saguaro cactus, and the uh, desert blooms all the way up to uh, Mount, um, the mountains in Flagstaff, which are um, at 13,000 feet. And that part of the state does get a lot of snow. Um, it's also a growing area. Um, it's very diverse, again, in its population and in the industries and things that are available. There are uh, three state universities in Arizona. Um, and a number of private institutions as well. So it's also a good place to think about studying. Next, please. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, my institution, the University of Texas at Arlington. We are part of the state university system. Uh, there are eight different campuses in the University of Texas system with Austin being the flagship uh, campus, which means it was the first established within the UT system. Uh, we are a large public research university, and uh, we, right now we have over 46,000 on-campus students and about 16,000 um, online students as well. Uh, we are the sixth most diverse campus in the United States, and when I talk about diversity, I just don't mean racial diversity, but include ethnic, religious, geographic, socioeconomic. Um, we have students from all 50 states, 106 countries, and 4,100 international students with um, a number of students from uh, the MENA region. Because we're such a large institution, we are able to offer over 180 degrees at the bachelor, master, and PhD level. And we are located in the northeast portion of the state of Texas, uh, in the booming Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area, which is home to almost 7 million people. It's the fastest growing metropolitan area in the United States, and it's the fifth largest media market in the nation. So if you're interested in journalism, um, television broadcasting, uh, print journalism, it's a really nice place to be housed because you will have ample opportunities to do CPT and OPT, as well as internships over the summer months. One of the things I'm really proud of for our institution is that we are in the top 100 safest campuses in the United States, um, which is really interesting coming from a state of Texas. So um, I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that we are able to, do, to be one of the safest. Um, because we are large, we have split ourselves into the seven colleges and schools. Uh, architecture and, uh, and public affairs also includes interior design. Business includes everything you can think of in business, including um, economics. We do train a lot of the teachers, uh, the K-12 kindergarten through year 12 teachers for the state of Texas, as well as having masters and PhD programs 
for uh, students who want to perhaps teach at a university or uh, run a school district. Uh, College of Engineering, which is where I work, we have seven different um, categories of engineering that we offer, everything from biomedical to, to mechanical, material science, um, aerospace, and electrical engineering. College of Liberal Arts covers everything from art, architecture, languages, history, political science, journalism, and music. Um, our art department has a uh, studio space on the west part of campus where you can uh, study everything in the studios from painting and drawing to graphic arts to glass blowing. We're one of the only campuses in the United States that has a glass blowing studio and there's a lot of glass blown art all throughout the campus because of that. Our College of Nursing and Health Innovation is open to international students. Um, our nursing department provides the state of Texas with 75% of the nursing staff um, that's employed in the state. Our College of Science includes everything from, you know, biology, math, psychology, and everything in between. And our School of Social Work is one of the highest ranked uh, for the, at the graduate level. Next, please. So student life is really important. Uh, we do have a lot of on-campus housing, but there's also off-campus housing that our students do uh, take advantage of. Some very smart uh, local entrepreneur builders started building student-centric uh, housing um, apartments, and each bedroom has a built-in desk. So you don't even need to bring your desk, it's already provided there for you um, in some of those off-campus apartments. Um, our main library in the center of campus is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week except for the um, winter holiday. Um, during very stressful times, they uh, build a small fence in the lobby of the library and they fill it with puppies. And so if you're really feeling stressful around finals or midterms, you can go sit in the pen with the puppies for a little bit and kind of de-stress yourself. So it's, it's kind of a nice thing that we do offer. Um, each department and college does have its own private library as well. We do have fab labs and maker labs. Um, when COVID hit, uh, we started making the uh, face shields that we then donated to um, all of the local clinics and hospitals in, in the DFW area. We uh, manufactured over 5,000 of those. Um, so we're pretty happy about that. Uh, recreation and sports is really important. You know, you have to do your mental and physical health. And so having a recreation center, uh, many different kinds of sports, 300, uh, clubs and organizations um, to fill your um, other needs, whether it's music or cricket or um, singing or a pre-professional organization is great. Uh, we do offer career services that will help you build a resume, will teach you interview skills, teach you how to dress for an interview, how to hold a cup of coffee and shake hands at the same time without spilling uh, your coffee um, and all kinds of other job seeking skills as well. Next, please. So our admission process is really quite simple. Um, all we need is the uh, application and the fee and your, and your test scores or your transcripts or mark sheets. We do rolling admissions. So once we have all of the documents we need to make that decision, we will, make, we will give you the admission decision. We don't have one big date where we release uh, decisions, but we do them throughout the year. Um, because of COVID, uh, we are waiving all exams, um, except for an English proficiency exam. Um, we don't want to put any of you at risk, so we do recommend you take the Duolingo exam, which uh, you can do from the safety and security of your own home. Uh, the minimum score for admission would be a 105. Um, priority deadlines are important if you're looking for scholarships. December 1st for undergrads and March 15th for graduate students. And that's all I have for um, Arlington. And now we will move on to the question portion. So um, if you would like to um, raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, I see one question. Do a lot of international students get CPT or OPT? Would one of my colleagues like to address that? Sure. Um, you know, I, I uh, also help students file these um, documents as well. And so 
OPT, it depends on, I guess, the school, I suppose, but I would say all, you know, 90% of our students either do OPT or go on to graduate school in the United States. Um, you know, probably 10% will return home because they maybe have jobs lined up or something like that. But OPT is very common. CPT, it depends on the program. Um, you know, some of our students are, you know, they have, um, it's maybe not conducive to internships or that it's, you know, they have lab work that they're doing on campus. And um, so they don't really need that sort of off campus work experience because they're getting it on campus. But um, it's a, but still pretty common, um, but it does depend on the institution. But um, yeah, so I would say, and, and really there hasn't been any changes to CPT in, well, the six years I've been doing this and OPT, um, there's been some slight fee increases, but the only change was they've increased the amount of time for OPT. Mm -hmm. And that was what I think four years ago, so. Awesome. So this is a question I like. Um, can I study a foreign language as an international student? <laughs> Who would like to handle that? Sarah, you want to dig into that? Yeah. Uh, so yes, as um, an undergraduate student, which I think is where the question was coming mm -hmm. from, um, it should be easy for you to uh, take this as an elective or even minor in uh, another language. Um, so yes, it will be possible. Um, and we absolutely love students to learn additional languages. Now, if you happen to be in a location where uh, Spanish is spoken widely, um, even inside and outside of the university, then you'll definitely have an opportunity um, to practice and have make friends uh, who will help you learn that additional language. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, uh, it will be possible for you to learn a uh, second, third, or fourth language if you choose. Awesome. So um, do any of the institutions have a PhD in special ed? I believe I do, but I will have to check. I know we have a variety of uh, PhDs in education, mm -hmm. but let me check on special ed. Yeah, I know we just added a master's in special ed, um, and I believe the hope is to have it eventually be um, a PhD, but it does not exist at this time. Anybody else want to jump in? No? Okay. Um, Christy. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> so uh, in what ways can international students connect with and volunteer with the surrounding community? Well, that's great. And I'm, I'm glad that this question has come up because I think that um, it, having international students get involved in the community and go out and do outreach is really important and a great way to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of us, uh, many of the universities who are located in college towns, those cities really do depend on the students to come out and be volunteers and be active in the community. So there's definitely a lot of ways that students can um, get involved. A lot of our campuses, such as uh, my campus, has an actual office on campus that connects students to local um, nonprofit agencies for volunteer activities. We also have Volunteer Tuesday, where we bring things to campus where you can come and uh, pack up um, certain bags for um, the uh, like the food pantry mm -hmm. and do other activities. So that's kind of a common part of um, being part of the campus and easily accessible. So we really do encourage students um, to find out those opportunities and the campus will be able to help you with that. Awesome. Anybody want to comment further on that? Nope. Okay, so uh, Patrick and then Corey, I'm gonna give you guys this one. Um, do you offer teaching assistantships um, on your campus or research assistantships? Patrick, you first. Yeah, we sure do. Um, so typically teaching assistantships, um, you know, it's kind of a 50-50 split, it seems like, depending on the program. Um, so they would be working with um, mostly running lab sections for undergraduate mm -hmm. courses. So, you know, if you're a biology teaching assistant, you're going to be overseeing two or three lab sections of biology 101. Um, the research assistants tend to be more in the fields like biomedical engineering, basic biomedical sciences, where we don't really have the equivalent undergrad program. Um, but typically about 20 hours a week, um, for both of those programs. Some universities will have like, um, if you have an assistantship, you'll take less courses in a semester. 
Um, so that might be a question you want to ask. Are they expecting you to take nine credit hours and have an assistantship or are they going to reduce that? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at our institution, it's a tuition reduction plus a stipend. Some universities include insurance. So that might be just a good question as you're looking for those. Don't just ask if they have TAs or RAs. Also ask, you know, what sort of benefit packages come with them as well. And, and I would add to that that um, beyond just if they do have TAs and RAs, uh, my institution, for example, reserves TA teaching assistantships and research assistantships for PhD candidates, uh, specifically because we don't think that um, most master students are ready to necessarily manage all or part of a, a course section. Um, and so at the PhD level, yes, TA and RA is certainly available and most of our PhD candidates will uh, have some mix of those throughout uh, their their PhD program. Uh, at the master's level, many schools, including uh, my own, will have what we call graduate assistantships, and this is basically a form of on-campus student employment, uh, hourly work uh, in one of our academic departments, perhaps in an ad administrative office or something of the sort. So um, beyond looking at just whether those positions, TA or RA, exist, uh, what level is that available for undergrad, masters, PhD, uh, to make sure that um, that's available for the level uh, to which you uh, are applying as well. Awesome. And I'm going to assume this next question is coming from an undergrad student. Um, so do scholarships require a special application? What about financial aid? Um, and does this differ from university to university? So I'm going to pop in first and say yes. <laughs> it does depend university to university. And I know that can be a little frustrating sometimes because there's 4,500 of us in the United States. Um, not all of us are able to offer um, financial aid to international students. My university is state funded, so I can only offer merit aid to or merit scholarships to international students um, and not meet full need. Um, for many scholarships on my campus, there is not a separate application. We look at your application and if you qualify for a certain scholarship, it's automatically given to you. Um, some of them include an out-of-state tuition waiver, which vastly, um, greatly uh, lowers your cost of attendance. Um, one of the things about financial aid or scholarships you want to keep in mind is there is a difference between tuition and cost of attendance, which is everything included. So, Christy, would you like to make a comment on that at all? Um, yeah, I think that you covered a lot of um, important facts, but I think um, it is important students to reach out to the schools that you're interested in because we're here as university representatives to help you walk you through that process mm -hmm. so that you understand what you need to do, what applications or documents you need to submit. And another reminder that I'm sure you're hearing from your counselors and your Education USA advisors is the earlier you start this process, the better off you're going to be because students that get in early have a chance to meet early deadlines, have a chance to um, maybe learn about different opportunities and get all their documents in. Um, you know, we have a, a priority scholarship deadline on January 15th, and we have one common scholarship application that you fill out, and this makes you eligible for all scholarships. So that's how it works at our university. But I would work with you and make sure that you had everything um, that you needed to submit it so that you were eligible. So you really need to reach out to each school that you're interested in and do it as soon as possible. Anybody else want to comment on that? And I have, I have uh, two really short um, questions before uh, we uh, end this session. So uh, Sarah actually has two questions and I'll ask them together. What is your favorite spot on campus? So that's the first one. And how much flexibility do I have to create my own student club? So Corey, let's start with you. And we'll just go down the line. Uh, let's see, my favorite spot on campus. So we're an urban campus. We're in uh, New York City. So we don't really have the traditional green college campus, so to speak. But we do have uh, Washington Square Park, which is in uh, southern Manhattan, or the southern part of Manhattan, which uh, is the closest thing that NYU has to a campus green. Uh, it's a beautiful area where there's music, people gathering, and uh, 
enjoying themselves, just taking a little break from the city. So Washington Square Park, look it up. Awesome. Sarah. All right. Well, uh, my favorite place on campus, that's a hard one. Um, so I I'm going to say too, uh, we have a nature preserve, uh, which when it's a little cooler here, so usually uh, December through March, uh, it's really nice to, to walk through it um, and just enjoy being in uh, a nature uh, preserve inside of the university itself. And then there's also uh, these like large benches that swing. Um, so oftentimes when you can find a free one, um, it's really nice to have lunch there. And it's kind of like in this courtyard, uh, there's a fountain that's nearby. So you get to hear the water. Uh, it's just a really uh, peaceful place. And I think the other question was uh, flexibility to create uh, student organizations. Absolutely. I believe you need to have uh, you plus four other friends. Uh, and then you file some paperwork with our student organization um, uh, office and you get funded. So it's pretty straightforward and pretty easy to, to do so. Awesome. Patrick. Yeah, my favorite spot um, normally would be the National Music Museum on our campus. Um, it's um, going undergoing about a $10 million renovation and expansion so that the building's done, but it's going to take another year to get all the instruments loaded in. But that's always a neat space to go. And um, they, every Friday they have brown bag um, lunches where you bring a lunch and they have um, people from all over in the country and the world really that come and play the instruments or give talks on it. But so right now, other than that, I would say the student center, you know, it's just a fun place just to sit and have lunch and kind of see the students and the you know, DJs on Fridays. And, you know, the energy there is kind of nice when you're feeling kind of bored in your office to get out and see that people are actually having fun. Christy. Um, that's hard, but I would have to say uh, the greenhouse. We have a quite expansive greenhouse with all sorts of flowers and trees and bushes. And it's so nice to go in um, and just enjoy it on a cold day. It's a nice little escape. They have benches. Um, they also have two birds that kind of fly around an iguana and a little alligator so it's just a nice little escape um, so that you can go and students can come in all the time and, and just enjoy that little respite. Nice and for me my favorite place on campus is the architecture uh, gardens. Um, there's a lot of uh, student built um, outdoor sculptures and there's also a beautiful fountain and it's and it's very treed and it's green and it's a very quiet spot in the middle of campus and when you're sitting there you don't realize that a four lane traffic road is only about 200 yards away it's like it's so enclosed that you can not even hear the traffic so it's it's really quite nice um, none, of, none of us said an academic building so <laughs> I don't know what that says, but um, I think it says that there's a lot of great things to discover on U.S. campuses. <laughs> Absolutely. And I also noticed none of us said our own office, right? <laughs> but I know many of us haven't seen our own office in many months, so we're pretty much all working remotely. Um, so this last screen, you know, has all of our contact information on it. You know, do contact us if you do have questions that you'd like to know about. We know that this recording is going to be made available to you um, after the fact. We just really appreciate your time uh, spent here with us today. We hope you learned something and we do look forward to hopefully seeing some of you on our campuses in the near future. So thank you all so much. Uh, wish you a, a wonderful weekend coming up. And um, again, thanks so much for coming here today. Thank you, Lynn. I want to um, say thank you to Corey, uh, Christy, Patrick, and Sarah. And Lynn, I feel like I've just toured the whole United States. <laughs> I'm, I'm from the Midwest. So Christy, you spoke to my neighborhood. But um, I enjoyed um, learning everything about the different regions. And I hope our participants enjoyed it, um, enjoyed it as well. Lots of great questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paula. Nice seeing you again, too. <laughs> and there, the recording will be um, posted on Facebook if anybody wants to watch it afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.